I got some more folks filing in. So in the interest of time, let's, uh, yes, let's start. We only have 30 minutes. This topic can go way beyond. <laughs> it can be a days, but let's start. So uh, hi, my name is Alia Borker. I'm a software engineer, and I've been a developer for 20 years. And um, I'm currently a design authority for Feast Platform and JP Morgan Chase, and uh, in our uh, asset wealth management line of business. Uh, and I've worked uh, during the you know course of the years. I've worked on many enterprise systems, monolithic apps, and also service-oriented architecture applications, and uh, industries such as telecommunications, media, and now financial industry for more than five years. So in the last three years, I've uh, uh, moved to microservices, and I've been creating microservices and deploying to a custom pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, platform called Gaia. We always have to give cool names. It's some Greek goddess in JP Morgan Chase. And we're having a lot of fun with it. But uh, just out of interest, I, I want to know how many of us here have worked with enterprise systems uh, versus traditional you know, web apps? OK, so, oh, okay, great. So it's like more than 50%. Uh, that, that's great. So uh, the reason I'm here is to talk about data integrity concerns in enterprise systems, which still tend to be a bit different and more complicated than uh, web apps, uh, that, that, you know, such as even Netflix. So that's why I'm here. So let me start. So I, I pose this question. Uh, microservices architecture means that you have zero concerns for data consistency now, right? Is that true? Not, not true. And that's what I'm going to be focused on. Um, in the last three or four years, uh, I've seen um, a new adopters of microservices uh, struggle to, uh, to put enough time and focus and upfront design for uh, managing the data integrity uh, in distributed systems. And there's a rush to move to microservices infrastructure. And there are many very, very good reasons of uh, moving to uh, the cloud infrastructure. But we still have to put in due process process and thought into how do we manage data integrity, right? All the concerns of distributed systems of yesterday are still present, and they still need a solution. So uh, th that's why I want to focus on you know, bringing in a little bit more clarity and, and refocus on this need, which really hasn't gone away. OK? So uh, I threw in this slide to show what our monolithic and our service-oriented architecture systems uh, used to look like. So the shapes uh, can represent uh, some components. Uh, so you have, you know, with a monolithic application, you would have all the components always being deployed um, as a unit, as one application instance, and in different environments on a predefined infrastructure. Uh, and the, the predefined infrastructure didn't go away with service-oriented architecture, also known as distributed components architecture. Now you had service providers coming in and, and developing individual services called components. So we always like to give new names in the industry, right? So we began with components. Every, everyone was components programming mad for a while. And then now we're all just talking about services. Uh, it, it's exciting. It's fun. But we kind of have to remember some of the same uh, concepts still apply. So, so we were components, and now we are service-oriented. Uh, we used to call ourselves service-oriented architecture, but there was a lot of tight coupling still, and all predefined infrastructure. And uh, some of the usual pain points, as you can imagine, in monolithic applications, and all of you who worked with enterprise applications already, were um, you know time to market and the lengthy, which was caused because of the lengthy regression test cycle and the user acceptance test cycle for every single small minute change that had to occur in any component. Uh, and then, lo and behold, even after a lengthy regression test and user testing uh, process, you could still have catastrophic failures. I should not have done that, but <laughs> I'm almost blinded, but hey. Um, because you know one specific use case was not sufficiently tested. Now, how many of you have faced that problem? You know, you had a great regression test cycle, and you spent like three weeks or, or one month with your operation users or your business users testing, and you still had a massive failure, which caused a rollback. OK, great. We're not the only ones then. JP Morgan is not doing anything wrong, but you know, <laughs> excuse me. Um, 
So, so the, the pain points of uh, monolithic applications uh, didn't quite go away with service-oriented architecture either. Um, we still had lengthy regression test cycles and lengthy user acceptance cycle, and uh, also, again, failures and uh, after production releases. So let's see what's happening. Uh, so when we talk about transactions, I wanted to revisit uh, what was, how were transactions handled in uh, legacy systems? And before we even do that, I should level set, what is a transaction? You know, we should have a basic uh, definition of transaction that I want to build upon. So um, I'll say the most basic definition of transaction is a sequence of changes, a sequence of events that occur as a single operation. Right? So if you let that sink in a bit, you could have a, a set of changes. They all have to go in. So it's all or nothing. Um, otherwise, for in case of a single point of failure, the entire set would be reverted back to its original state. Right? So, so that is the basic definition of transaction. So in purple, if you follow this diagram, I've tried to, to um, show how would a monolithic application manage uh, transactions. We used to all have these great, uh, that big drum that you see there was a big helper. Uh, these were the RDBMS databases, you know, the oracles and the SQL servers and the really the Trojan horse, and not the Trojan horse, but really the um, workhorses are in the monolithic application development world. And uh, that provided us with a, a, a way of um, leveraging a gatekeeper, which, we, which was our database. Uh, and the database would, would handle the, the consistency of transactional flows by uh, ensuring that the set of changes either went in all or, or none went in, and there was a rollback implemented. So the databases were key to managing consistency with monolithic application, a shared database. So if you have, for example, and um, customer come in, in a simple online book selling application, not Amazon, way more complicated, a lot more features. So a simple rudimentary online bookseller application, which is uh, going to say, for example, allow a user to find a book. Maybe they're interested in uh, Harry Potter, the Order of the Phoenix. I was recently ordering it for my daughter. It's just fresh in my mind. And uh, say they see a count of 10 books available. And the customer then decides, well, yeah, they're going to buy that book. Okay, so they click the buy button, and uh, they uh, they submit their payment information, which makes a call to a payment service. Um, this could be a component within uh, the monolithic application or a distributed component running on another infrastructure or provided by a service provider. And in either case, the the expectation is that if the payment fails for any reason, for example, the Perhaps the credit card uh, information was invalid. Yeah. The expiration date was not correctly provided. Then uh, another customer who logs in uh, and searches for Harry Potter, the Order of Phoenix, should not see the original count of, of uh, should see the original count of ten and not nine because the, the first customer's transaction did not succeed. Hence, the the count of books should not decrease. So that is what we mean by data integrity and consistency in a transaction. So uh, we still have to uh, take care of these uh, scenarios with our new paradigm. But I did want to bring in also retouch on what was two-phase commit. So with service-oriented architecture, uh, we entered into the, the complicated environment or basically of having service providers having to interact with one another to ensure this consistency across boundaries. So uh, we came up, then there were these entities, transaction managers, which uh, then became the gatekeepers. Every transaction manager had a registry of registered uh, resources that participated in specific transactions. In this case, it would be buying a book transaction. And, um, and then either synchronously or synchronously, the, the, every single change was, was uh, checked and verified before the entire transaction was succeeded by the transaction management. So the complexity came in, and uh, we still have to manage this cross-boundary um, transactional flow. In the old days, we used to do it with our databases and RDBMS, um, you know, relational databases and with transaction managers. But we want to do something better now. We, we, all of this infra, uh, diagram that you're seeing up here, all these boxes here are still uh, were very tightly coupled and dependent on predefined infrastructure. 
And uh, for great reasons, the industry has decided that we no longer want to be uh, having to design upfront all our scalability needs of 10 years from now, or even three years from now. We want to be able to scale up and down and be fast to market. Uh, and uh, so this type of uh, rigid infrastructure, which leads to tight coupling, it wasn't working well anyway. So where are we now? Uh, we are, uh, so I tried to throw in a little diagram of uh, what our components look like, now called microservices, um, and in the environments of today. So you could have, uh, microservices can be scaled as needed. That's a great benefit of having a microservices architecture. In fact, um, in JP Morgan Chase as well, depending on the volume and the traffic, uh, we scale our services on demand and we're not, and we're actually uh, on our Gaia platform, we actually pay per instance. So our infrastructure cost is only, um, is, is going to be about our on demand and it's not preset. So we, we do see uh, a benefit in reducing our costs by spinning up infrastructure only when demand requires that a new instance be spun up. So as you can see here, microservices no longer uh, mean that the same set of services will be deployed on one infrastructure environment. You, you could have a, a complete mixed bag. This leads to um, uh, reducing all the dependencies between services and decoupling so that your time to market, your specific service, if you're a service provider, your time to market is not impeded by um, another service provider's uh, delivery cycles, for example. Okay? All right, so we still have transactions. They didn't go away, right? Nope. So we're back to the simple online bookseller service. And a uh, customer is trying to, uh, again, buy the book. Uh, now you see there are even uh, more uh, connection points with microservices architecture. So with a service-oriented architecture, we used to have a few more connection points. And with microservices, we have expanded the number of connection points, right? So the point of failure could, um, has uh, increased. And uh, we still need to uh, handle the transactional Integrity, uh, again, the count of books should not be decremented if payment service has failed, is, is a simple example to keep in your mind. Uh, and at any point, you could have multiple instances of any service running on the cloud. Uh, I just like cloudy um, you know, pictures, so I just put everything in a cloud here, but uh, uh, yes. So that's about it. And by the way, transactions are not always user uh, initiated. You know, I'm coming from the enterprise, uh, in my mind, I think of it the most complex data management systems, um, which is financial systems presently, and before then, uh, also insurance. And uh, transactions can be initiated by other services as well. Right? So you can have a, an admin, I've shown a, uh, a user here, but you could have an admin uh, service actually um, calling in a, a grooming process, initiating a grooming process, which would be um, changing the perhaps refreshing items in the books catalog. So a transaction initiation can occur from a user or from other services. So, and, and in both cases, data integrity uh, concerns are, are valid and need to be handled. So I threw in this quote, yeah, it, it seemed apt to me. Uh, life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Uh, don't resist them, that only uh, creates sorrow. Let reality be reality. Uh, let things uh, flow naturally forward in whatever uh, way they like. This is from Lao Zee, right? And it seemed up to me. I mean, I mean, just think, if we can design our new systems that uh, are built with microservices to expect failure at every connection point, then we'll build great systems. We should not uh, hope that there are no failures. We should plan and expect failures and design our systems such that our uh, data needs, our data integrity is, is, uh, is going to be maintained regardless of failure at any point. So that's the goal, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Okay, so in order to walk us through some uh, concepts, I, I wanted to bring in a simple uh, application with a few simple use cases, and that'll help us uh, walk through some important concepts before we can get to uh, the couple of approaches that I want to present on how to manage uh, consist consistency and data integrity needs uh, in, with microservices applications. Let me also check my time. <laughs> 
Okay. So imagine you have a simple tour operator online application, right? Uh, not thinking orbits in Expedia, but we, we've all used Kayak orbits in Expedia, hopefully. So if you get the general idea. And uh, in, in such an application, at a very basic level, a uh, customer should be able to search um, available tours. A uh, customer should be able to book a tour, and an admin can add a tour, right? Simple use cases. So we have simple use cases, and this is going to help me talk about an important aspect, which is what is the domain and context here, right? So we need to talk about domain-driven design and bounded context. And uh, I'm going to come back to uh, these use cases when I talk about the domain-driven design and bounded context. So I threw in some uh, diagrams here. So when we think about uh, context, we have, uh, for example, the booking tour use case, right? Uh, we have a customer trying to book a tour. When a customer is trying to book a tour, uh, they will probably be de dealing with the concepts of a tour, a vehicle, customer reservation, hotel reservation, and hotel. You know, some general conceptual entities that you can imagine are in, interplaying and interreacting to produce a, um, to allow a customer to book themselves on a tour, which is offered on no November 1st. Maybe this tour is hiking in the Appalachians, right? And on the right-hand side, you see a tour search context, right? In tour search context, uh, you also see the tour conceptual entity, you see hotel, and you see tour catalog and top 10 list. But I, I ask you to think um, with me of, uh, here, tour in this case may not mean exactly the same thing, and actually it does not mean exactly the same thing as a tour in the booking tour context. Tour for the search tour context could mean that um, uh, anytime there's a unique name, for example, hiking in the Appalachian, that denotes a unique tour, right? So the dates may not be relevant in the search tour context at all because the search tour context may just be trying to categorize tours by top 10 list, perhaps top 10 tours in North America list, if you can think it through like that, then the, uh, the tour uh, conceptual entity means different things in different contexts. This is what we mean by bounded context. And uh, when we uh, further expand this idea that your use case flows uh, have a specific context and your entities are relevant in, within that context, then you design your domain model, which leads to your physical data model uh, creation, right? So uh, let's follow that through, right? So, so now I'm going to pick one use case. Um, uh, so instead of the three use cases I had listed, uh, customer searches available to us, customer books a tour, and admin adds tours. I'm going to choose a customer books a tour. So I'm sticking to one bounded context, and we, we still have some decisions to make when we think about domain-driven design. There's some options. All right. So uh, you could uh, decide to model your, um, your data model, your domain model first, which can then lend itself to data model uh, with a large aggregate model or a small aggregate model. Now, the key difference here is that on, in the large aggregate model, you have a compositional model where the tour is composed of the other entities. The tour is composed of vehicles. Perhaps, you know, there's a boat uh, that is involved in the first leg of the tour, and then there's a bus that everyone's going to be boarding. Uh, and lastly, there could be another uh, boat that brings you back. Perhaps it's a list of vehicles. And then a tour, uh, which is Appalachian hiking in the Appalachians on November 1st, could have a list of customers already um, reserved on that tour. And you could also have a list of hotel reservations uh, for, uh, for that tour as well. Right? So it's a compositional model. If you notice anyone who remembers UML, <laughs> it's still, I still use it uh, these days. And as you can see, that black diamond uh, denotes compositional uh, uh, modeling. And on the right-hand side, you could also decide to model the uh, domain model as small aggregate model where you have, um, you know, you have a tour and a vehicle customer reservation, hotel reservation, all uh, disconnected and only hanging on to a 
um, a value object called tour ID to make the connection. So, so I should have also backtracked and, and talked about exactly what is an aggregate, right? So if anyone who's not come across aggregate, when we talk about domain-driven design, an aggregate uh, means that there is a, it's a cluster of object, interrelated objects, which are uh, going to be updated or changed for that cluster of objects will always go through one route. So within a cluster of object, one object will be <coughs> nominated as the aggregate root, and that aggregate uh, root will be responsible for making any changes in the entire cluster of objects. Okay, so, it's, uh, so that is uh, what aggregate root means in these diagrams. So as you can imagine, with the large aggregate model, uh, you, you'll have a few um, blocking, extra blocking scenarios if you think about it. Two customers trying to book in the November 1st hiking in the Appalachian tour. And the, uh, with the aggregate route uh, being a tour, then every time there a change needs to be made to any part, say a customer decides they want to switch their hotel reservation, or uh, they decide they're going to add another family member, then the entire cluster of objects is going to be locked and unavailable for updates till the first uh, transaction has completed. Right, so I'm just doing a time check. Right, with the smaller aggregate model, you have uh, less dependencies. You have decoupled your, your domain model in a way where multiple updates can, can occur. It's totally kosher because every aggregate root is responsible for the set of changes inside its, its boundary. Right, but there's more to discuss on, on this. So uh, again, I tried to just consolidate the pros and cons, uh, and I'm going to bring it back to transaction boundaries. So with a large uh, aggregate model, uh, it's compositional object model, and it's familiar to UML users, right? From legacy to present, there is continuity, so that's reassuring sometimes. But uh, and then, uh, but it does result in a large number of user transaction failures. Uh, where, if, for example, if you have two users logged in, and we're going to see this some more, uh, and if someone is hanging on to an old um, instance of the aggregate, then their request will be rejected if they're trying to update, if someone else wins. So we'll see a little bit more on that. So you have generally poorer user experience with a large aggregate model, but there, there are uh, good scenarios of uh, using a large aggregate model because it does ensure data Data integrity, right? If you're going back to your monolithic ways, you do keep everything in one umbrella, one transaction manages all changes. Uh, with a smaller aggregate model, uh, it does reflect the more purer sense of microservices, uh, multiple microservices interacting to complete a use case, right? A microservice, by the way, should, uh, should, is almost a one-to-one -one within, aggregate, uh, within aggregate. So when you think about microservices and domain-driven design, you should automatically equate one aggregate to a microservice. And there are a lot of articles written on this, and I've added some links uh, also uh, to the last slide, and I believe the slide is available, these slides are available on the schedule. Right, so uh, we do improve user transaction success, right? If someone is uh, changing uh, the customer reservations list, uh, then they do not have to necessarily block another customer trying to um, maybe pick a hotel reservation on the route, right? And, uh, and, but small aggregates still have uh, uh, to handle cross-transaction boundary uh, communication, right? If you think about it, you, you, if you are, um, and we're going to see this actually a lot more. Let me not jump ahead. So uh, I wanted to get into two design approaches, and I want to uh, present the, uh, the first approach, which is uh, optimistic concurrency with shared databases, which everyone who's worked with enterprise systems in the past is, should be quite familiar with. Uh, so when you have a shared database and you have a large aggregate model, optimistic concurrency still works pretty well because it's, uh, it's the entire uh, paradigm is to allow most updates to go in and only uh, reject uh, updates when there is a, uh, evidence of uh, overwriting behavior, right? And we'll see this, but I want to show you upfront what are the two options I want to uh, get into some details on. And the second option is, of course, well, event, event, uh, eventual consistency across distributed systems. 
Uh, so this is going back to the small aggregate model, right? We said it's purer. It lends itself more to the microservices architecture because one microservice really equates to one aggregate uh, when you look at domain-driven design. Uh, and uh, so we, we cannot rule out eventual consistency across distributed systems where, uh, for example, a, uh, a booking, a tour booking application really doesn't need to know when a payment application finishes processing a customer's payment. So that would be cross-transactional uh, communication uh, across bounded contexts, and we'll look into that as well. So uh, just to finish up on the optimistic uh, concurrency model, so with optimistic concurrency, we get optimistic locking uh, provided by our really <coughs> excuse me, uh, shared database. And in the tour operator online application, how this would work is the tour aggregate, which is, no is nominated as the tour root, it would have a version number, and each time any change is made to any uh, of its composite entities, uh, the database version would be checked for that tour instance, and if the version on the thread making the call is different from the version found in the database, then the entire transaction is rejected. So this is the old way of working, uh, of ensuring data transaction integrity. And if you design a large uh, aggregate with microservices, it still works very well. So the pros are, of course, data consistency. Uh, needs are met fully, because you are in charge of uh, all or nothing within one um, microservice, one large microservice that you've designed. And uh, it's easier to debug because, again, all the parts of uh, all related entities are inside one microservice. And, uh, and you have, but the biggest problem is we haven't shared uh, dependencies across transactional boundaries at all, right? So all the parts of a, a tour booking application would kind of have to roll out like a monolith. So you, this would be the first cut of migrating a monolithic application to microservices architecture. And as long as the uh, bounded context is not huge, it's still a viable option. So we don't want to throw away optimistic locking uh, and all the the benefits that our database is provided um, unless there's, a, there's good reason. Some of the good reasons are, of course, <clears throat> you may have uh, hit an infrastructure wall now. Maybe you're not able to scale anymore. There's just no space left in your database. And you must uh, create or bring in a new database server. If the minute you bring in a different persistent store, you may as well change your, uh, my, your design paradigm and think about uh, smaller aggregates and multiple microservices and how to handle data consistency across transactional boundaries. So that brings us to event sourcing paradigm. And I'm keeping a time check, but I think I'm good. So with event sourcing, things become a lot more fun. As you know, I've been enjoying myself exploring this. Um, so now you have uh, the, the more freedom to, uh, to communicate across transactional boundaries, right? So across bounded context. Your tour uh, booking application has its APIs. It has event handlers, data handlers. It has its own persistent store. It's completely separate from, say, a payment service, right? You could be on Chase uh, Pay, Apple Pay, uh, any payment service that's being leveraged. You would be in, in enterprise um, world, you would actually have multiple payment services being leveraged and the user being uh, allowed the access of choosing their payment service. And uh, that's how we like things to be. We want to give users choice, and, in, and we do not want tight coupling on the infrastructure layer. So, so you see these bubbles. These bubbles are trying to uh, denote context. So each, uh, each microservice, tour booking service, payment service, and admin service are running in their own bounded context, their own data model, and, and physical um, data model and domain model as well. And all the interactions between these contexts is through a distributed event log. So this is a general paradigm, and we're going to see how this works with our simple um, online tour booking. Uh, use case. Right, so before we do that, I do want to talk about one framework which allows us to implement such an uh, event streaming uh, uh, paradigm, event sourcing paradigm, and that is Kafka. So uh, I've become uh, quite a big fan of Kafka recently, and uh, uh, Kafka is, um, is, is providing us um, the key APIs to <clears throat> publish a stream of records to one or more topics 
And we can also, uh, out of box, we get a consumer API to subscribe to one or more topics. And we're gonna get in a little bit of, of what these things mean in Kafka. And then there's a streams API, uh, which kind of think of it as your ETL layer of the olden days where you used to transform data that was coming off of uh, out of different databases or uh, through message calls from other services. So you, there are many times where you need to transform the data before you can consume it. Right? Uh, even if you think about your JSON uh, and your Jersey and Jackson, there are always transformational needs, even with the REST APIs or any interactions between any systems. Uh, so uh, Streams API is now part of Kafka. It became part of Kafka, I believe, in version 10, uh, 1.10. And uh, then we have also the connector API, which is your basic uh, way of connecting to uh, Kafka topics. So this uh, Kafka um, platform, as you can see, uh, there's a lot more information, of course, on it, on the Kafka sites as well, kafkaapache.org. It started off, uh, um, it was started by LinkedIn, and now is uh, under the Apache umbrella. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so Kafka cluster is, is as a, can have multiple producers, multiple consumers, multiple connectors, and multiple stream processors. It scales really well and provides uh, high availability and performance out of box. It's pretty impressive. A little bit more on the uh, Kafka concepts. Uh, each record gets a, a sequential ID a number uh, called the offset. Producers publish data to the topic of their choice and consumers label themselves with the consumer group and each record uh, published your topic is delivered to one consumer instance within each subscribing user group. And we're gonna come into um, and touch upon user groups a little bit more, consumer groups, because order with streaming, uh, event sourcing applications is pretty important. Order of message consumption is still very important and we need to consider that if we really need to achieve, if planning to achieve data consistency, All right? Okay. So coming back to a simple tour booking um, application, uh, what if we implemented it with Kafka? How would things look? So again, you have your tour booking service. Perhaps it has an API called Make Reservation, uh, and it's, uh, it has a Kafka stream client, you know, with the streaming APIs that come with Kafka. Uh, it could be a producer, a registered producer, maybe with the label AA with its own name, and it could be, uh, there could also be a consumer group A, right? So it could be consuming messages also, meant for tour booking service. For example, what about acknowledgements from payment, payment service that, hey, yes, I received customer XYZ's uh, payment request and I've successfully processed, so uh, their reservation is, is good to go, yeah? So asynchronous communication between bounded contexts, that's what we're trying to achieve. So payment service could likewise have its own APIs, process customer uh, payment. Again, uh, be, uh, has a Kafka, a Kafka stream client and be registered as a producer and uh, also have a consumer group B that it's participating in. Admin service likewise has uh, its own APIs changed to a route perhaps, the itinerary is changing. Perhaps there was a hurricane and, and you know you can no longer dock at a specific Caribbean island and you need to be diverted to hopefully not Texas, but maybe <laughs> if you're starting off in Boston, possible. Uh, and then you have this concept of uh, topics in Kafka. So you could have the tour application topic, uh, admin topic, payments topic, and each um, a Kafka producer can choose to, uh, to write to specific topics. So it's a lot of freedom. And you can also choose to consume from multiple topics as well, right? So both ways, flexibility. Uh, the order of, uh, uh, and I should bring the highlight the, the important concept of consumer groups. Now, since one instance in a consumer group will get to consume uh, a message that is subscribed on, um, it, it generally it's a logical subscriber, for example, tour booking service, and it's multiple instances that would make up one specific consumer group. That's pretty important because you do, you do need tour booking service to get all acknowledgements uh, or uh, declinations from payment service, 
right? You wouldn't want to be missing out a message by mixing in a log uh, tour booking service and a payment service and an admin service in one consumer group, which then causes uh, some of the messages not to get to tour booking service instance. So you have flexibility of scale here, because uh, depending on your scalability needs, tour booking service could have n number of instances running, and all of them are registered as uh, consumers in their own consumer group. So very achievable, but some things to think about. Um, right? So <laughs> I think I'm reaching the end, yes. All right, so to, just to sum it up, uh, don't, don't forget your data. Uh, data inde integrity within and across uh, multi-user transactions still needs to be handled uh, with microservices uh, architecture. And in this presentation, we've discussed two design approaches to manage data integrity and across transactional boundaries. So thanks for listening, everyone. And <laughs> any questions? Thank you.